Hi, my name's Mark, and this is my psychic wife. Hey, I'm Victoria, and welcome to my psychic life. Hey guys, Victoria Paxton here. Thanks for stopping back by my YouTube channel. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about Lisa Stebbick. Okay, so you know how I do. I'm going to give you all the information first, and then I'm going to talk about connecting with her and what happened from there. Okay. So you know how I do, I'm gonna go over all the info and then we'll, I'll talk about connecting with her. So Lisa Ruttenberg Stebbick was born May 19th, 1969. She was 38 years old and the mother of two at the time of her disappearance. She went missing from her home in Plainfield, Illinois. So pretty much from the beginning of the case, they had suspected her husband, Craig Stebbick, was probably involved. Um, she was reported missing by a neighbor on May 1st, 2007. So her and her husband, Craig, were separated, um, but they still lived in the same home. So Craig, I guess, had stated that he believed she had been either voluntarily or forcefully taken from their residence at 6 p.m. on April 30th, 2007, which is the night before she was reported missing. So her car uh, was still at the residence when she was reported missing. Her car was still there. Her purse and cell phone were missing. There was no activity on her credit cards. Okay, so Craig and Lisa had been married for 14 years. Uh, Craig had filed for a divorce in January. So the January, she disappeared April 30th, May 1st. So that January prior. Uh, they had had issues in their marriage, but they were still living in the same house, you know, and it was a mutual divorce. They both wanted it. Um, they lived separate lives despite living in the same home. So the day that she went missing, she had just had her husband served eviction paperwork. So um, she had told her attorney that Craig was controlling and he was abusive to her. Um, she also talked about how their financial situation wasn't good and there were supposedly, supposedly he had lost his job. I don't know if that's true or not. So, uh, so Craig went on to say he was in the backyard doing yard work and he sent the kids on a bike ride and he heard her leave around 6 p.m. So she used to go walk at a track like that's in the back of a, I guess, a high school that's local. She would do that every night. <clears throat> so she supposedly left her car there and took off on foot. And that was kind of strange because it would have taken her like an hour to get there and it was already getting late at this point. Um, the police pretty quickly thought something was fishy. Something just didn't feel right. Um, they didn't understand why why it was that Craig, her husband, why didn't he report her missing that night when she didn't come back from supposedly walking or running at the track at the high school? Why didn't he call and report her missing then, you know? Apparently, Lisa had told her neighbor, look, if anything ever happens, you know, call the police. So uh, the police then went to try to track her cell phone, um, but it was like a burner phone because Craig was really controlling and he only let her have this phone where you could like buy minutes or whatever. So um, the people at the, that were at the track every night knew her because they would all go and walk there together every night. And every they asked and everybody said, no, she hadn't been there that night. Um, okay. So at some point the police found a tarp in the back of Craig's truck with blood on it and Craig said, oh, well, I'm a hunter, so, you know, I'm sure it was deer blood. So they tested it, and guess what? It came back as Lisa's blood. But it was just a small amount, so it didn't necessarily show that she had been fatally wounded, I guess. Uh, pretty quickly, Craig was a, you know, person of interest in her disappearance. Um, he had, at this point, he had stopped cooperating with the police. He wouldn't do a lie detector or anything, and he didn't want his kids to be interviewed either. Also, something strange is Craig filed for sole custody of the kids. That doesn't make any sense. 
he came out and said it's because he worried that she had just ran off and he didn't think foul play was involved. He thought she was going to come back and take the kids. Come on, dude. You know better. He's full of crap. He was just trying to make it look like he thought she had run off. You know? Uh, okay. So, the police didn't think she had just run off. They had reason to believe that it was more than that. Um, interestingly enough, then at this point, Craig went into court and withdrew his divorce paperwork. Well, think about it. Why did he need to pay for a divorce when he knew she was already dead? You know, hello. Okay, so they had a rally to raise money for a reward. They had a rally to raise money so that they could offer reward in her case. And apparently one of Lisa's family members went up to one of the kids and said, you know, your mother loved you. She would have never left. She would have never walked away. This pissed Craig off. And after that, he wouldn't allow his kids to speak to Lisa's family at all. Just pretty messed up if you ask me. Okay, so in 2007, the kids were 10 and 12, and they were called to testify before a grand jury. There was never, a lot of tips came in, but nothing ever was able to stick. So I don't know what happened with the grand jury. I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. So in 2009, Craig was arrested for threatening to harm, threatening to harm his neighbor. Wow. Wow. Okay, so now let me go into um, connecting with Lisa. So when I first connected with her and she came through, I couldn't put my finger on it, but I was like, man, she looks like somebody. Who does she look like? And I kept trying to figure it out. And I was like, who does she look like? Who does she look like? Well, I ended up figuring out it was the actress Jennifer Garner. She looks a lot like her. She resembles her. Yeah. Yeah, so she was a complete sweetheart, bubbly personality. She immediately started talking about her kids and how she checks in on them constantly. And she kind of, you know, sees them all the time. And, you know, she's grateful for that. Um, she talks about how important it was for her family to find her body. Um, she goes on to talk about, um, you know, how horrible it is that her kids, you know, weren't able to speak to her family, you know, and she's, that really was something that concerned her. Okay, so I asked her if she would talk about, you know, what led up to her disappearance and yeah. So she brought up that she'd been going to a counselor. Um, she talked about in the past that she was really close-lipped to her family and friends about Craig. She didn't want to say anything negative about him because she said her biggest fear was if she said what was really going on and then they ended up working things out, her family would hate him. You know, so she, she said, I always, you know, just tried to say the positive, never the negative. So she said that for like the last 18 months of her life that her husband did everything in his power to try to make the kids hate her. Um, she said, you know, it was evident. It, it was horrible. She said, you know, <clears throat> even though the kids were young, they had watched their dad being horrible to her and being rude to her. And so they were doing the same thing to her, you know. Um, she said that her kids had said a few off the wall things to her. Um, that their dad had said, you know, I just wish your mother would just disappear. He said this to the kids. And I mean, he's just, he's a psycho. Like, so he had always been verbally abusive and controlling, but she said like the last 18 months, he had, it was more than that. He had become physically abusive, verbally, emotionally, and, you know, he was really putting her through the ringer. Um, she eventually spoke to her sister and some friends and her neighbor, um, you know, and talked about how bad the marriage was and that she needed to get out of it. And she had went so far to actually tell the neighbor that, um, you know, if anything comes up and I happen to be missing, can you call the cops for me? 
that's why I guess the neighbor is the one that calls and reported her missing. Yeah. Um, she said that <clears throat> uh, when she spoke to the neighbors, they said that there were many times when they heard um, Craig screaming at night at her, going off on her, and they could hear noise, and it sounded like he was, you know, knocking her around and trying to hurt her, and, you know, the neighbors said, you know, we didn't want to get in the middle of it, we didn't know if we should call the police or not, so let me just stop right there. If you're ever anywhere and you hear somebody fighting and you hear a woman, and if she's crying out like she's being hurt, I don't care if you want to get involved or not, you need to call the police. Seriously, you know, you've got to call the police. Had my next door neighbor not have called the police when my ex had me locked in that room and when he shot at me, I wouldn't be here today. So I, I don't care if you're afraid of hurting their feelings or whatever. If you think that a woman is getting the crap beat out of her or even a man, you know, you call 911, period. Like, come on, y'all do the right thing. Okay, so anyway, so Craig confronted her that last day and said, who in the F do you think you are kicking me out of my own effing home? So apparently he had received the eviction papers and he was going off. He's like, you can't kick me out of my effing home. And I guess he was extremely heated and angry. Um, she said, you know, she tried to stand up to him. She said, you know, I'm sick and tired of having the kids in the middle of all this. You're trying to turn the kids on me. You know, it's too much. You've got to go. You've got to move out. I mean, you have to move out. This is just not working out. Yeah. Um, she said for so long she had walked on eggshells with him. And she said, you know, at that point, all of a sudden her brain connected and she was like, okay, I got to calm down. I've got to calm him down. So at that point, she was just doing whatever she could to appease him to try to calm him down because he was so angry, you know. Um, she said, you know, she was scared to death. Like, yeah. Um, the kids were outside. He hollered for them to come in. And she was like, oh, gosh, why, why is he telling, you know, why has he got the kids coming in? Um, he handed them money and told them to go to the store to get some junk. So, <sighs> so he then proceeded to to slam the door, the kids ran out, he slammed the door, he goes out out back and she thought, okay, maybe she's gonna leave me alone, you know, let me just go calm down. She said she went in the kitchen, got a drink of water and she was trying to calm down. Um, okay, so he stormed back into the house, she was in the kitchen, she came around the corner and there he was and he had a rifle. He grabbed like her hair and the back of her neck and started like pushing her through the house and he got her out into the backyard. Um, she said there were, there was a tarp, an ax, and like big huge commercial trash bags laying there. She said, you know, she knew like she felt like her life flashed before her eyes and she saw her kids and you know, she knew that was it. And she said it was peaceful. She said, she didn't feel any pain. It was quick. I asked her, I said, did he shoot you? What did he do? And she said, she doesn't know. She doesn't know. She just knows like it was peaceful. She didn't feel any pain. Like that was what she, you know, was focusing on when she was thinking back. So apparently when he had grabbed her inside, she brought up that he made the comment, I'm going to throw you out in the garbage, like the trash that you are. Um, yeah. So I asked her, you know, where's your body? What's going on? And she said, honestly, I don't, I don't know where my body is. I don't know if it's intact. I, I don't know any of that. I don't know. I didn't see any of that. Um, and I don't know why, but I felt like those commercial trash bags, I felt like I think he just threw out like the garbage, you know, like the trash that she was supposedly, you know? <sighs> yeah. Um, she went on to speak about, I told her, you know, talk about whatever she wanted. She talked about her grandmother. Um, she said she knew that her grandmother was sad that she was never able to have a burial. She talked about the Shmira and how important that was for her family. I didn't know what this was. I felt I felt so stupid and I didn't want to interrupt her because she was kind of like on a roll talking. 
So I looked it up and discovered that the Shmira is when a Shomer or a guard is a watchman that stays with the body day and night from death until burial. Um, so I guess that's part of her culture. Um, she's Jewish, so I guess that was, you know, something important. Um, she went on to say that you know, she was kind of sad that her kids would never know anything about her culture and her faith and her family. Um, yeah, that's something that saddeners, saddens her. Um, yeah, but you guys, I mean, I, I don't know why, but it's like I know, like he just literally threw her out. So I don't know if she ultimately ended up in a bag in the landfill. I, I don't know. But I feel like he disposed of her in the trash. I think that I think that last um, I think that last little thing that he said to her. I think that's I think that's what he ultimately ended up doing. Um, yeah, it it, it it is really sad. It's sad that I hope that her kids have reconnected with her family at this point. I really hope that's happened. Um, I don't know, but I am, I, I, you know, I hope that there's no lasting effects to her kids as well, but you know, when you're raised with a psychopath, there probably are, there probably are some issues for the kids, you know? Okay, guys, so listen, COVID-19 is scary. Stay home. Don't be running out. Don't be going around people. You know, we need to try to kill this virus, you know, and do as much minimal damage as we can. And the only way to do that is for people to stay at home and not to be going around people. Like, stay home. My husband and I had been in, cooped up inside, so we went to a cemetery. And, of course, there was nobody there, right? So, but on the way to the cemetery, we're passing by all these stores and all these grocery stores. And they're just packed. They're packed like a normal Saturday. I'm like, this is freaking ridiculous. You know, we're supposed to be socially isolating ourselves. We're supposed to be at home. Like, this is insane. <sighs> yeah, people just, I don't know if they'll ever learn. But be kind, guys. Wash your hands. You know, stay away from elderly people or people that are sick. So, yeah. I hope everybody's safe and I hope everything everything's good for everybody despite what's going on in this crazy, crazy world. So, all right, guys. Bye.